Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Liens and Security Interests in Farm Products. My name is Annie Tribaletti, and I will be your moderator. Joining us today is Paul Hodnafield. Paul Hodnafield is the Associate General Counsel for CSC, where he is responsible for advising the company regarding real estate recording, notary, uniform commercial code, and other public record transaction services. He is a subject matter expert and frequent speaker on filing, recording, and search issues, and has participated as a panelist in numerous continuing legal education programs for the ABA, state bar associations, and several other organizations. And with that, let's welcome Paul. Thank you, Annie. Uh, yeah, in my role at CSC, I, it's my responsibility to be the subject matter resource for all things related to the search and filing process for UCC and related records. And in that capacity, it's my job to be involved in the industry. So I, I uh, participate with the filing officers and their organization, IACA. I monitor case law. Uh, I monitor legislation on a daily basis. I uh, do a lot of troubleshooting with filing offices, and I also co-chair a task force on filing, offer, filing office operations and search logic for the ABA. So needless to say, I get a lot of information from a lot of different sources, and uh, the favorite part of my job is when I can share that information, uh, and, and that's what I'm going to do today and um, on a specific topic, and that has to do with uh, uh, liens and security interests in farm products. I put together this program because the the farm filing topic generates a lot of questions, both from a, a filing and from a search perspective. One reason is that there are a lot there, there there simply is a lot of confusion out there over what public records are involved in the agricultural finance process and and how they're used. And this partly results from how lenders and legal professionals commonly describe the records involved. Uh, imprecise terms such as farm filing or agricultural liens are frequently bandied about when discussing these transactions involving farm products. However, these terms are all too often misused. They will lump together different types of records that each have distinct purposes, requirements, and legal effect. Uh, it is essential that those involved in the agricultural finance process understand the purpose and the use of each of these different public records that might be filed or searched as part of the transaction. Uh, my goal today is to explain the basics of the applicable laws and um, uh, you know, what the, that at least those that might require the filing or searching of a public record as part of a transaction involving farm products. Uh, these will include which laws apply, the, the purpose of each of the laws, what records may need to be searched or filed during the due diligence process, and the general compliance requirements for each record. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to do today is uh, I'll begin with an introduction uh, of the different records involved, then move on and discuss what exactly are farm, pro oops, what are farm products anyway, and then I'll move through and talk about the different types of uh, laws and records involved, uh, applicable to security interests, agricultural liens, uh, and uh, the Food Security Act. I'm also going to wrap up with a very brief overview of the uh, Perishable uh, Agricultural Commodities Act, or PACA, even though it technically doesn't involve any search or filing. But with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as a threshold issue, what exactly are we talking about here when we're talking about farm filings? Well, farm filings, as that term is often used when I hear people talk about it, it can mean one of three things. It can mean a, a UCC financing statement filed in connection with a security interest, an agricultural lien, which may also involve a financing statement, or an effective financing statement, which has nothing to do with the UCC, at least not directly, um, which would be filed under federal law. So to break this down just a little bit, there, there's three types of records that could be filed in relation to a farm filing, and uh, they consist of a UCC security interest. It's a consensual lien, um, voluntary lien granted by the debtor. Uh, it uh, uh, generally will require the filing of a UCC financing statement. And we'll go into more detail on all of these three um, items a little, little later. 
Then there's also the agricultural lien, which is not a UCC security interest. An agricultural lien is a non-consensual lien that arises by uh, uh, operation of statute. Um, however, it may also require the filing of the UCC financing statement. And then finally, uh, a, a filing in the central notification system, which is established under the Food Security Act. Uh, the, the record which would get filed for that purpose is an effective financing statement. Now, uh, of these, all three of these are different. Uh, for example, the security interest, security interest is a type of lien. An agricultural lien is a different type of lien, and it is separate and distinct from security interest. And a, an effective financing statement filed in the central notification system is not a security interest. It is not an agricultural lien. And in fact, it is not a lien at all. It is filed for an entirely separate purpose. So we'll go into much more detail on each of these three types of records that, will, uh, uh, that may get filed in connection with farm financing. Uh, first, though, let's take a look at uh, an important aspect of this, and that what, what are we talking about as far as the uh, uh, collateral that would be subject to these records? What is a farm product? Because that's what this is really all about, is uh, uh, taking farm products as collateral. Well, a farm product, uh, farm product is a term that's defined in Article 9. And um, in a nutshell, it's what you would expect it to be. It's, uh, although there are some exclusions. For example, standing timber is not a farm product. But um, to the extent the debtor is engaged in farming operations, um, it, it would be goods, which are crops, livestock, or uh, supplies used in farming operations or the products of the crops or livestock in their unmanufactured state. So the threshold issue here is, uh, first of all, is the debtor engaged in a farming operation? Because uh, that, in order to be a farm product, it has to be uh, with, in respect to which the debtor is engaged in a farming operation. Farming operation is also defined under Article 9, and it means uh, Again, what you'd expect, the raising, cultivating, propagating, fattening, grazing, and on down the line of uh, uh, crops or livestock. Uh, it also, the, the products of livestock or in, and crops have to be in their unmanufactured state. What exactly does that mean? Well, an unmanufactured state uh, is not a term, uh, it's not a term defined by Article 9, um, but uh, I guess the courts would determine it on a case-by-case -case basis, but uh, based on the comments to Article 9 and things, there are some ideas of what constitutes uh, processing or manufacturing. Uh, there is some processing allowed, for example, pasteurization or, or boiling syrup into sap uh, generally would not be considered uh, part of the manufacturing process. However, uh, perhaps uh, uh, taking that syrup and then bottling it or uh, using the pasteurized milk in, in uh, some other product uh, might bring it into that manufactured state. And once it's in a manufactured state, it loses uh, its characteristic as farm products and turns into inventory of who, ha who happens to hold it at that time. Um, Taking a look at the definition of farm products, uh, there are, are a wide variety of things that can be farm products, and I'll give you an example here. This comes out of uh, Louisiana. This is a list of farm products that Louisiana has uh, published uh, for use uh, under their Food Security Act, uh, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. And in the types of things that could be farm products, uh, are the obvious things you would expect, things like cattle and chickens, soybeans, corn and onions, that type of thing. But there's probably some things in here that might uh, raise an eyebrow. For example, minnows can be a farm product under the definition we just uh, reviewed. Uh, somebody who's raising minnows for uh, sale to be used uh, you know, as fishing bait, for example, they're in the... Uh, it may be a farming operation for the production of those minnows. Um, 
surprisingly, of course, this is Louisiana, so you might have some interesting things on here, and that's, uh, uh, that certainly is the case. For example, alligator eggs uh, can be a farm product, and in fact, apparently, uh, they raise enough alligator eggs that they uh, warranted their own code on the list in Louisiana. Uh, I would hate to be the farmer that had to uh, go and uh, take those out of the nest, but uh, alligator eggs can be a farm product. And even squirrels, for some reason, uh, squirrels is considered a or can be considered a farm product uh, in Louisiana. Um, somebody must be raising them out there for some purpose. I have no idea what, but uh, there's a uh, again, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, for Louisiana or any other state, anything that falls within the definition based on um, uh, farming operations and uh, farm product could be considered a farm product. But the mere fact that a, uh, a, a good is either livestock or uh, some sort of animal or a, a vegetable of some sort or a fruit, that doesn't automatically make it a farm product. Uh, this is especially the case when it comes to uh, certain animals. For example, a, a horse. Horses can be, certainly be a farm product, but they can be other types of goods as well. Uh, and there are cases out there uh, that have addressed this issue, and they, they go back a ways. But um, here's an example, uh, the, the Casimir versus Connolly case. Uh, this involved an issue where uh, the, the question was whether a horse constituted consumer goods or equipment under the UCC. It wasn't even a question of whether it was a farm product, and that was because the, um, uh, the parties involved were not engaged in manufacturing operations or in uh, uh, farming operations. Uh, the horse is being used for other purposes, and the, the question was, was it a consumer good where somebody was uh, somebody owned the horse, you know, for just for uh, pleasure, for riding purposes, or was it uh, used for some other purpose under the UCC? And there, the, the court deferred to a jury uh, to determine what the primary use of that horse was. So the courts will typically look to what is the primary use of that good, um, and uh, you know, if it's something other than a farm product, if it's being used as equipment, uh, it will get classified as equipment. Uh, there are other cases as well. Racehorses have been defined as equipment by the courts. Now, the courts are going to address this always on a case-by-case -case basis. So it is important to uh, you know, take a look at all the facts and circumstances around it. But the important thing to take away is that the mere fact that the good is an animal or uh, some other type of uh, uh, growing thing, that does not automatically mean it's a farm product. It has to... Uh, uh, it has to fall within that definition that we discussed, and the the um, debtor has to be engaged in farming operations. Well, let's talk about the first of the first of the applicable laws um, that we need to discuss um, in, when discussing uh, agricultural finance or farming oper financing farming operations, and that is security interests in farm products, which are of course governed by the Uniform Commercial Code, Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Well, farm products under Article 9 are a type of good. Uh, they are goods. And as goods, they're subject to the normal uh, rules for Article 9 for perfection and priority. They're really no different than any other type of good. Uh, perfection uh, of a security interest in farm products is done by filing a financing statement. The law of the debtor's jurisdiction, uh, of the jurisdiction where the debtor is located, is going to govern perfection and priority of security interests. So the uh, financing statement will be filed in the jurisdiction where the debtor is located under Section 9307. Uh, and uh, priority will also be determined under the Article 9 priority rules. There are no special priority rules for a security interest in farm products. Uh, with one exception, and that is the purchase money security interest. Um, uh, there are special rules that apply to a purchase money security interest in livestock. Um, for those of you that, have, that 
have worked with purchase money security interests, the rules for a purchase money security interest in livestock are actually very similar to a purchase money security interest in inventory. Uh, there is no 20-day window uh, after the debtor receives possession of the livestock in which to perfect. The security interest must be perfected before the debtor receives possession of the livestock. Uh, there is a notice required that is very similar to the notice required for a purchase money security interest in inventory. The difference is um, that while the notice has to be sent to the holder of a conflicting security interest, uh, it must be received within six months before the debtor receives possession of the livestock. In other words, the notice letter is effective to cover um, deliveries of the livestock for a six-month period. With uh, a purchase money security interest in inventory, the notice is effective to cover deliveries for a five-year period. So it's a much shorter period uh, when it involves a purchase money security interest in livestock. Uh, the content requirements of the notice are very similar to the purchase money in inventory. And uh, just like a purchase money security interest in inventory, the uh, secured party bears the burden of proof for compliance uh, compliance with all the requirements of obtaining that purchase money security interest, and they must strictly comply with these requirements. And as a result, the best practice for sending the notice is just like for a purchase money security interest in inventory. Uh, it should be sent by certified mail or some other method that will provide uh, uh, proof of delivery. Now, as I mentioned, purchase money security interests apply to farm products just like other things. Uh, and with, with just some special rules for livestock. But for other types of uh, farm product collateral, the purchase money security interest rules don't always fit. I mean, how, do you, how does a lender uh, enable a debtor to acquire um, something that's grown on, on a farm? Uh, it may not be altogether clear uh, how the lender could get a purchase money or that uh, superior priority in those crops, and for that reason, um, there is a, a an optional provision in an appendix to Article 9 called a production money security interest. The production money security interest is uh, an optional provision that the states were able to enact if they wanted to, um, and uh, what it does is it uh, is essentially the equivalent of a purchase money security interest. However, only seven states actually enacted the production money security interest provisions. Uh, what these include are um, special definitions for a production money security interest. Uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, general description of what a production money security interest is and how it works, as well as the production money uh, security interest uh, perfection and notice requirements, which again are very similar to uh, the uh, requirements for purchase money security interest in inventory or a purchase money security interest in livestock. Now, if uh, in the states where this is available, if the secured party does perfect a production money security interest, uh, it is substantially the same as a purchase money security interest, um, but um, it is available to uh, rather than uh, somebody that provides goods on credit or enables the debtor to uh, purchase goods, uh, this is available to those who provide inputs, the, the, the value that enables the debtor to uh, produce the crops. In many senses, uh, this is similar to agricultural liens, with, which we'll come to in a minute, and I'll explain why when we get to those. Uh, one other thing I want to cover about uh, uh, security interests in uh, farm products is that there is one special rule when it comes to the disposition of collateral. Um, just like any other type of good, if the uh, debtor disposes of the collateral um, you know, without the secured party's authorization, um, it, the security interest will continue to follow that collateral. But there is an exception, and this applies um, to uh, most types of goods, and that is um, if, oops, sorry, uh, let me back up a second. If the debtor does dispose of the farm products without uh, the secured party's authorization, 
then the secured party can bring a replevin or a conversion action against the party that acquired the goods from the debtor. Um, and that's following an unauthorized disposition. Uh, likewise, the security interest will attach to the proceeds of the collateral, so the secured party ordinarily will have a choice. Go against the proceeds uh, held by the debtor, go against the uh, uh, transferee for the uh, conversion or return of the collateral. There is a big exception to this, though, and that is if uh, the buyer, the transferee, is a buyer in ordinary course of business, the buyer will ordinarily take free of a security interest created by the seller, even if the buyer knows of its existence. However, Article 9 carves out farm products from uh, the buyer in ordinary course. In other words, a buyer in ordinary course of farm products from the farmer, the person engaged in farming operations, will still be subject to that security interest under Article 9 at least in the official text of Article 9. It was due to this provision that uh, the Food Security Act was enacted on a federal level, and I'll explain when we get to that portion how it applies uh, to this provision. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about agricultural liens. Agricultural liens uh, are not UCC security interests. They're very different. There is a definition uh, it is a defined term in Article 9. It means an interest in farm products that secures payment or performance of certain obligations. Um, and uh, the obligations are, uh, arise from goods or services furnished in connection with the debtor's farming operation. In other words, somebody that provided inputs that enabled the debtor to uh, raise a crop or ra raise livestock. It's created in in uh, favor of the person who provided those inputs in the ordinary course of business. Uh, that, in other words, they're in the business of providing the types of goods or services or, or they're in the business of leasing agricultural property uh, in connection with farming operations. And the effectiveness does not depend on the person's possession of the personal property. There are uh, agricultural liens out there that, uh, uh, you know, common law liens that, uh, um, you know, uh, possessory liens, common law possessory liens for people that might provide certain uh, services for uh, livestock, for example. But uh, they would not fall within the definition of agricultural lien unless um, you know, it wasn't dependent on possession for perfection. Uh, so, uh, again, we are looking at a key determination, is the debtor engaged in farming operations? If they're not engaged in farming operations, uh, are, uh, the, uh, uh, an agricultural lien uh, or the definition of agricultural lien wouldn't necessarily apply. Uh, some examples of common agricultural liens out there, and I should point out that each state has its own focus of uh, agricultural lien laws, but there are some that are very common. Uh, a landlord's lien, this is where, uh, typically where a farmer will rent out a portion of their land to another farmer uh, who raises the crops. Um, an adjuster's lien, oftentimes uh, uh, this will be a, a lien for um, uh, you know, tilling or uh, harvesting, that type of thing. Um, you know, the various other types of liens, liens for services of stallions and so forth, veterinarians, seed, uh, seed providers, other agricultural inputs such as uh, uh, maybe fertilizer or um, uh, chemicals. Uh, a, a farm worker might be able to obtain a, an agricultural labor lien, and uh, there are special liens out there for harvesters. So there's a wide variety. What they tend to have in common is they enable the debtor to produce the crops or livestock. There are inputs that enable the production of this. So in, in many ways, these are like a production money security interest or a purchase money security interest because they are enabling the debtor, at least in part, uh, they're enabling the debtor to produce the, the crops or the livestock, the farm products. Now, some general things to keep in mind about agricultural liens. One is, uh, again, I can't emphasize this enough. An agricultural lien is not a security interest. A security interest is a consensual lien that arises by contract. An agricultural lien is a non-consensual lien that arises by operation of law when the statutory requirements are satisfied. But 
agricultural liens fall within the scope of Article 9, and therefore, uh, to a certain degree, they must satisfy Article 9 requirements. Now, lenders, uh, those who are uh, financing farming operations, generally are not going to be entitled uh, to obtain agricultural liens. Agricultural liens generally arise in favor of those who provide the inputs, goods and services that enable the debtor to produce the crops, not necessarily those who just provide money that enables the debtor to acquire the crops or livestock. <laughs> so it's, uh, lenders don't need to worry too much about filing them, but they do need to worry about searching for them. Uh, the agricultural lien statutes out there, uh, they may have additional uh, requirements for creating the lien, and they may have their own priority rules. Now, when article, I, I mentioned that Article 9 applies to agricultural liens, but not every portion of Article 9 necessarily applies to agricultural liens. Only the portions of Article 9 that specifically refer to agricultural liens apply to agricultural liens. So uh, you, you may see uh, uh, a requirement for the uh, uh, you know, financing statement must be filed to perfect a security interest or agricultural lien, but uh, the priority rules may state just security interest or just agricultural lien. Same with choice of law provisions. Here's a list of the Article 9 uh, provisions that relate directly to agricultural liens. Except for what is uh, specifically uh, sp except for what specifically applies for an agricultural lien under Article 9, uh, any questions will be resolved from the agricultural lien statute itself. So when it comes to perfection of an agricultural lien, the first thing to be concerned about is what's the filing location, which would also be the search location. A different law may apply to an agricultural lien that applies to a UCC security interest. The general rule for agricultural lien choice of law, <clears throat> or, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. First of all, uh, when it comes to perfection of an agricultural lien, when does it become perfected? Uh, well, it's perfected if it becomes effective under the applicable statute and complies with the requirements of Section 9310. And 9310 requires the filing of a financing statement um, in, in virtually all cases. Only a security interest can be perfected by possession. Now, as I said, there may be a common law, um, uh, common law lien that enables the uh, perfection of a, a lien in uh, uh, farm products by possession, but not uh, an Article 9 agricultural lien. As far as the state lien perfection requirements by statute, sometimes the state lien require the, st the statutory lien requirements will require, in addition to compliance with Article 9, they'll require uh, perhaps the filing of a lien statement at a local or state level. They all may also require uh, notice to be sent to the uh, debtor. It varies widely from state to state. So you may have the lien statement, you may have a notice requirement. And it is necessary to comply with both the state lien law and the UCC in order to get access to any special priority that would arise under the agricultural lien statute. And that's because the agricultural lien statute um, may, have, uh, may specify a different priority, and Article 9 will defer to that. Now, uh, getting back to where I was on the filing location, that's going to be dependent on the governing law. Uh, the governing law in the case of farm products is the law of the jurisdiction where the farm products are located, not the location of the debtor if they are different. For example, uh, my family used to have a farm right on the Minnesota-Iowa border, and there, uh, there were some farming operations that actually farmed on both sides of the border. Um, it may be necessary, uh, for example, to uh, search or, and, and file uh, for agricultural liens, both in the jurisdiction where the debtor is located, which may be uh, Iowa, and where farm products are located, which may be Minnesota, in order to pick up agricultural liens. Um, 
So they're not filed necessarily where the debtor is located. May, they may coincidentally be filed there, but uh, the governing law is the law of the jurisdiction where the farm products are located. So uh, a, an agricultural lien, or I should say a financing statement filed to perfect an agricultural lien would be filed in the central filing office of the state where the farm products are located. If a lien statement is required to be filed, uh, that's going to require taking a look at the uh, applicable agricultural lien statute and where it designates. It may be at the county level, it may be at the state level, it may be in a different filing office uh, than other types of uh, documents would be filed. You, you have to check the applicable statute if you're searching for the lien statement. Now, when filed in the central filing office, the lien statement potentially could be effective as a financing statement if it satisfies all the requirements for a uh, financing statement in, in Section 9502A, which means the correct name of the debtor, uh, name of the secured party, and an indication of the collateral. Um, uh, I don't recall that this is anything mentioned in Article 9 or in the official comments, but there is some case law out there that mentions uh, that a lien statement could be effective, although it was in dicta, so that this isn't a hard, and, a hard and fast rule. Now, the content requirements of a lien statement, if, it, if one is required, are set by statute, um, so you would have to look at the applicable statute. Uh, when it comes to attachment of agricultural liens, uh, the attachment rules of Article 9 don't mention agricultural liens, so it's necessary to look to the uh, applicable agricultural lien law to determine the scope of the uh, attachment of the agricultural lien. Uh, generally, they remain attached to the farm products uh, uh, following disposition, so the uh, claimant can uh, maintain an action both against the uh, debtor and uh, perhaps against uh, the transferee um, of uh, collateral. Um, generally, under Article 9, agricultural liens don't attach to proceeds, but they may under the applicable uh, agricultural lien law. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the priority of agricultural liens, uh, there are special rules that apply. Um, in general, under Article 9, uh, if, the, if there's no uh, special priority rule in the applicable lien statute, then the normal Article 9 rules would apply to, art, to uh, agricultural liens. However, if the state lien law uh, provides for a different priority for agricultural liens, um, the agricultural lien will get that state law priority uh, if that priority is created by the same statute that creates the lien, and the lien is perfected. Uh, for example, there, there was a case not too long ago um, where a feed supplier's agricultural lien had a super priority over uh, a, a bank's prior perfected security interest, and that's because that agricultural lien statute gave the feed supplier that priority, and, and it makes sense because the feed supplier enabled the production of the, uh, of the farm products that were subject to that lien, and therefore uh, the bank probably came out ahead. Um, in this case, the bank wanted to come out even more ahead, but uh, the court correctly held that the feed supplier's uh, lien did have the super priority because the statute gave it a super priority, and Article 9 steps back to the, uh, and defers to that lien law um, when there's a conflict with the Article 9 priority rules. So when it comes to agricultural liens, uh, just a few things to bear in mind. When it comes to filing, uh, lenders don't usually have to worry about that. That's going to be the issue for uh, the suppliers of uh, goods and services to those engaged in farming operations. Um, the, the claimant is going to have to file a UCC financing statement in the location of the collateral in the state where the collateral is located. Typically, that's going to be in the central filing office of the state where the collateral is located. And uh, if it's required by law, they may have to file a lien statement as well or provide uh, notice of the intent to claim a lien uh, to the uh, debtor. When it comes to searches, bear in mind it's important to conduct a UCC search in the location of the farm products if it is different than the state in which the debtor is located. 
So again, it may be uh, required to conduct UCC searches in multiple states uh, in order to pick up all the security interests and applicable agricultural liens. Um, you know, if somebody's looking for the lien statements as well, it's necessary to look at the lien statute and see wh you know, whether it was filed in the appropriate uh, office that's designated by the lien statute. So that's an agricultural lien. Now I want to move on and talk about the Federal Food Security Act with the, the time we have left. Uh, the uh, Food Security Act is not a lien. It's very different. Um, it is a federal law that was enacted in response to the limitations of Section 9320A, which is the um, uh, provision that exempts uh, uh, farm products from uh, the uh, buyer in ordinary course provision. In other words, uh, buyer in ordinary course of business uh, from a, a seller engaged in selling goods of that kind uh, is uh, going to take subject to a security interest in farm products under Article 9. And um, there were some, uh, some concerns about this by large buyers of, agriculture, or of uh, agricultural products. They did not want to be uh, subject to having to pay twice for the goods. So uh, they wanted some sort of protection. They went to Congress for this. So back in, in the 1980s, uh, these buyers of farm products went to Congress and they expressed concerns, and Congress uh, uh, held some hearings and made some findings. Specifically, the Article 9 carve-out of the farm products from buyer and ordinary course protection uh, you know, permits enforcement of liens against a uh, uh, buyer and ordinary course of farm products, and that this situation places those purchasers at risk for double payment and that leads to uh, um, preventing uh, free competition in the market for farm products. Therefore, Congress came up with the Food Security Act, which is codified at uh, uh, 7 United States Code, Section 1631. And the, what the purpose of this is, is to remove any obstructions to interstate commerce and farm products by uh, providing protection for buyers in ordinary course. The way it does this is uh, by preempting Article 9 with respect to the buyer in ordinary course of farm products. So it expressly pre uh, preempts Article 9, uh, the Article 9 provisions to the contrary. Uh, that narrows it down to Section 9320A. So what it does is it, uh, the Food Security Act provides that a buyer of farm products in ordinary course of business from a seller engaged in farming operations is going to take free of the security interest created by the seller. This is no different than uh, if a company goes into an equipment dealer and buys a uh, tractor, uh, they're going to take that tractor free of a security interest created by the equipment dealer, even though the buyer may be aware that the inventory of that equipment dealer is subject to the security interest. Um, here, Congress went ahead and made that, uh, that same rule applicable to buyers in ordinary course of farm products. However, there are some additional protections uh, for a secured party to a person uh, who uh, holds a security interest in those farm products. If the secured party sends a notice to the buyer, as provided by the Food Security Act, and notifies the buyer of uh, the security interest, uh, or if the state has, a, has certified a central filing system under the Food Security Act and the secured party files what's called an effective financing statement, um, then if the buyer has failed to register or search that uh, index, and uh, they can't be a buyer in ordinary course. So if either of these uh, exceptions apply, the buyer would not be a buyer in ordinary course and would take subject to the security interest created by the, the farmer. So there's two different ways to accomplish this goal. One is the notice to the buyer. Now, the Food Security Act provides that the secured party can send this notice to the buyer. It requ uh, the, the Food Security Act requires the debtor, upon request of, a, of the lender, to furnish a list of the prospective buyers of farm products and then the, uh, the secured party can then send the notice to all those prospective buyers. Uh, 
Now, that does not limit entirely the, the uh, parties to whom the debtor can sell the farm products. Uh, there are special protections if the debtor sells to other buyers. Um, so they can sell to non-listed buyers, but there are special uh, duties uh, that the, buyer, that the um, uh, debtor has to uh, abide by in order to protect that secured party. Basically, it creates a constructive trust, uh, if, if I recall correctly. But um, when it comes to sending the notice, the buyer is going to take subject to the security interest if it gets the notice within one year of the sale. Uh, so what that means is that once the secured party sends that notice, the notice is effective against that buyer for one year from the date the buyer receives it. And of course, the uh, secured party can send new notices whenever they want to. Now the notice to the buyer is, uh, uh, is the typical notice, the contents of which are spelled out in the Food Security Act. It has to have the name and address of the debtor and secured party. It must provide the Social Security number of the farmer. Uh, or um, it, it was amended uh, about 10 years ago to provide for other unique identifier numbers due to um, uh, privacy concerns over the Social Security numbers. It has to describe the, the farm products that are subject to the security interest as well as the payment obligations of the buyer to uh, uh, um, release the security interest, and the secured party has to sign or otherwise authenticate that notice. If there are mater material changes to the contents of that notice, then the secured party is under an obligation to uh, send an amended notice to the buyer within three months after the uh, notice has been, uh, uh, or after the change, I'm sorry. So that's one way to deal with it. Uh, another approach is what's called the central filing system. And the, the Food Security Act provides that the uh, secured party, or I'm sorry, that a state may apply to the Secretary of Agriculture for uh, certification of a central filing system into which uh, a, a record called an effective financing statement, not to be confused with a UCC financing statement, but into which an effective financing statement can be filed. Now, a central filing system, it's a statewide system for effective financing statements filed under the Food Security Act, and it has to be uh, certified by the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, there are some states that refer to this as a central notification system rather than a central filing system. Central filing system is what uh, the, the Food Security Act, uh, that's the term used there, um, but they're really interchangeable, uh, CFS or CNS. Um, in any event, to get certification, the system has to uh, permit the filing of effective financing statements. Uh, and um, allow the Secretary of State to compile those into a master list. Uh, the Secretary of State is responsible for maintaining uh, uh, the list of registered buyers uh, who receive the list. This includes commission merchants and selling agents. And then the Secretary of State would have to regularly generate and distribute this list uh, to each of the regist registered uh, buyers, commission merchants, and selling agents. And uh, finally, it uh, the Secretary of State also has to provide uh, one-off searches of these uh, uh, effective financing statement records for non-registered parties. Uh, the, um, because of the certification requirements, not every state decided to go ahead and take this route. And in fact, only a minority of states have central filing systems. Those that do are listed here. You will notice that there are three who have, uh, are asterisked. Uh, Maine, Vermont, and West Virginia obtained certification of their central filing systems back in the 1980s, but never implemented uh, the, the process. So they, they, they have certification, but they, don't, they never approve forms for this use or anything like that. Uh, so in, in effect, it's not, uh, uh, they're not using the CFS systems. Now, what gets filed in these systems? It's called an effective financing statement. As I said, it's not to be confused with a UCC financing statement. They are different. They have different purposes and different legal effect. 
For an effective financing statement, the content requirements are a little different. They do require the name and address of the debtor and secured party. They require the social security number or other unique identifier for the debtor. And uh, they have to have a description of the farm pro product subject to the security interest that is much more detailed than would be necessary in a UCC record. It includes the amount of the farm products, uh, if, if that's applicable, and then also the name of the county or in the case of Louisiana, the parish, where the farm products are located. Finally, it has to have the signature or other authentication of the debtor, although there is an exception in that the signature or authentication are not required on an EFS record in states that permit the electro or that uh, um, uh, allow electronic filing of the record. So it would have to be uh, it would have to be on a paper record recorded in the state, but it's not required on a record filed electronically in the same state. Now, once it's filed, an effective financing statement uh, is effective for five years from the date of filing. Unlike the, the direct notice requirement of the Food Security Act, the EFS record is effective for five years. And just like a UCC financing statement, it can be continued for additional five-year periods by filing a continuation statement within six months before expiration of that five-year period. Um, the... Uh, Effective financing statements can be amended, uh, just like a UCC financing statement. Uh, the Food Security Act requires amendment following material changes to the uh, contents. Um, as far as the contents of amendments, it's really very similar to filing UCC amendments. Uh, they do require the signature or authentication by the debtor in some cases. But as I said, if the record's filed electronically in those states that allow it, it doesn't require that. Uh, amendments must be filed within three months of a ma material change to the effective financing statement. Uh, and this is different than, uh, than for UCC financing statements, of course, which might have different time periods for required amendments following post-closing changes or post-filing changes. Um, when it comes to the uh, lapse of a an EFS record, uh, there is a, a record that can be filed uh, that terminates the uh, EFS record, otherwise it, uh, and it lapses upon the filing of such notice. It's called a notice of lapse. It really isn't a lapse. It's uh, uh, the same thing as a termination statement. Um, and uh, that requires secured party signature authentication. Again, uh, might be an exception for electronically filed records. Uh, when it comes to the sufficiency of an EFS record, uh, the the uh, Food Security Act says that minor errors do not affect the sufficiency if it substantially complies with those requirements. Only seriously misleading errors will make a record ineffective. It's uh, very similar to Article 9, with one big exception in that it doesn't, take, it doesn't have special rules for um, uh, errors in the debtor name. And UCC financing statements, of course, under Section 9, uh, uh, what is it, 9506B, Virtually any error in the debtor name will render the financing statement seriously misleading. There is not a counterpart to that for effective financing statements. As far as the forms, uh, the, those states that have central filing systems uh, have all generated their own forms. These can be a little confusing because many of them base them on the UCC statutory forms. They look just like a UCC record. Um, they, might, uh, they, they might be uh, slightly different, but they, they'll look a lot like a UCC record. They may even be called a UCC-1F or something similar. But these are not UCC records. They're not intended to be UCC records. Um, they use that similar terminology. They may look alike in many of the states, although several states have records that are very clearly not the same as UCC. Um, there is the potential, however, in some states, even though they're not UCC records, um, if they do satisfy the requirements for a sufficient financing statement, um, it is arguable that they could be effective as a UCC financing statement in addition to satisfying the uh, requirements for an effective financing statement. For that to happen, the state would have to file them in the same index as the UCC records, and there are states that, that do that. So it is possible that just because it says EFS, it could still be effective as a financing statement, 
uh, for UCC purposes, and for that reason it is necessary to conduct further inquiry if a search were to disclose an EFS record and the UCC records. Now, farm products lists, um, Secretary of State is responsible for organizing those lists and sending those out to subscribers, uh, arranging them by the debtor's uh, Social Security or unique identifier. Um, the uh, Food Security Act now doesn't uh, allow the Secretary of State to encrypt that information to a certain degree, but it must still allow searches by that information. Uh, then the Secretary of State has to go ahead and uh, disperse the list to those who uh, have subscribed to it. It can be either in paper or electronic form. Um, and again, the, the index in which these records are filed has to be searched, or it has to have the ability to be searched. Uh, for that reason, some states do commingle it with UCC, but there are some that permit separate searches. So in summary, the Food Security Act, uh, compliance with the Food Security Act is uh, essential um, because uh, for the secured party in order to ensure that a buyer of the farm products is not a buyer in ordinary course. Um, a financing statement is generally still necessary to be filed to perfect the security interest. The, U, the, the UCC financing statement perfects the security interest the uh, EFS record, the effective financing statement, prevents a buyer from being a buyer in ordinary course. And if the secured party fails to either file its effective financing statement where that's required or fails to send its direct notice in other states, then um, you know, it's, it's going to not have that buyer in ordinary course protection. That does not mean it's unperfected. All it means is that its remedies are limited to going against the proceeds in the hands of the debtor. It can't go against that buyer in ordinary course to try and uh, reclaim the goods or um, maintain a conversion action. <clears throat> to wrap up, I want to mention the Perishable Agricultural Commodities Act, or PACA, because I'm frequently asked if we can do PACA searches. Uh, PACA is designed to protect uh, the suppliers of fresh fruit and vegetables, things that are perishable. And it does this by uh, creating a constructive uh, trust. Uh, those who receive these perishable commodities are holding them in trust uh, for the unpaid suppliers and sellers. Uh, as a trust, there is no pub uh, and especially as a constructive trust, there is no public record uh, necessarily made of that that can be searched, and therefore uh, there are really no searches for PACA interests. But be aware, there is this thing out there called PACA, um, and it does apply to uh, uh, certain obligations that a, a debtor may have, but uh, no public record and um, not the same as a security interest or, uh, or a buyer in ordinary course protection afforded by the Food Security Act. So again, the important thing to remember is uh, you've got three different types of records applicable here. You've got UCC security interests, which have to be perfected under the UCC rules. You have agricultural liens, which are within the scope of Article 9 and require the filing of a financing statement, but also might require compliance with uh, uh, other law, the law that created the uh, uh, agricultural lien. And finally, the Food Security Act, which is not a lien at all, but it, it prevents a buyer from being a buyer in ordinary course and preserves uh, additional uh, protections or additional remedies for the secured party that files. Um, remember that these are three distinct, different documents and that uh, yeah, they should not be confused. And unfortunately, they are all too commonly confused, even by filing offices. You'll see filing offices referring to uh, effective financing statements as agricultural liens, which can be really confusing for people that are looking at the administrative rules or uh, a filing office's website.